Anyway, um, thank you for asking me to, to, to speak to you. And uh, it really came on the back of this field guide to the Caterpillars of Great Britain and Ireland. And so what I'm going to talk about is um, from this book, but some aspects of it, you'll hear more detail this evening. Okay, so um, I could talk all day about defence mechanisms in Lepidoptera, but what I'm going to do is to just talk about some particular aspects, and they're defence mechanisms against predators that find their prey visually. And uh, there'll be, I think there's one butterfly in the talk, a couple of micro moths, maybe more, but it's largely the larger moths that I'm going to be talking about, and especially their caterpillars. And the caterpillars are particularly interesting because what's a caterpillar got to do in its life? Well, it's got to eat and avoid being eaten. And there's not an awful lot else. I mean, there's the odd other thing like shedding a skin and finding somewhere to pupate. But by and large, they just have to eat and not be eaten. Now, um, the, um, there's been this traditional predator-prey arms race, evolutionary arms race over millions of years. And the selective pressures are enormous, really. So it's estimated that blue tit chicks alone in Great Britain and Ireland eat 50 billion caterpillars a year. Well, I think the program and also is with any predator prey interaction, there's an inequality in the stakes, really. So if the predator loses out, it loses a meal. If the prey loses out, it loses its life. So all these tremendous selective pressures have given rise to some remarkable uh, defence mechanisms, which we'll talk about now. So the aspects I'm going to talk about are firstly crypsis, that is blending in with the background, then warning coloration or aposomatism, and then mimicry. And then finally, we'll finish with a twist in the tail. OK, so crypsis to start with. So here's a moth, the large ranunculus, blending in very well with its lichen coloured background. We haven't managed to work it out. Here's the moth here. It does really blend in splendidly well. And what about this then? So this is a caterpillar of a moth called the Brussels lace. And it may be taking you a moment or two to work out where it is. Um, so I'll just give you one or two more moments and then I'll show you where it is, just in case you haven't worked it out. So here we are, here's the head here. And here's the body here, coming back to the tail end here. So doesn't that blend in well? It's quite extraordinary, really. And uh, the thing is that it can feed on different colorations of lichen as well. And if it does, then it blends in equally well. So here's the same species, Brussels lace, on a different colored lichen. So here's the head here. Here's the body here, coming down to the rear end here. So it's extraordinary, really. It just blends in so well. And then what about this? So this is a very big caterpillar now. This is the red underwing, the base of a willow tree. So at night it ascends up onto the branches and eats the leaves of the willow. But by day it descends and conceals itself just by blending in with the background, the base of the trunk. And the amazing thing is it's even aligned itself to the contours of the bark. Here's the caterpillar here, okay? Just following the contours of the bark nicely. And I can tell you, it was incredibly difficult to spot. And if we crop the image, you can see it a bit better here. And I'll crop it once more. Now you can see the caterpillar in its full glory. So this is a big caterpillar blending in terribly well. Now this is a caterpillar of the blotched emerald moth. And the blotched emerald caterpillar has these little spiky hairs on it, which enable the caterpillar to attach bits of vegetation to its body. 
So it feeds on oak. Here's the head of the caterpillar. Here's the body coming all the way back here. And these are bud scales from the oak that it's attached to its body. And it really makes it jolly difficult to spot. We used to have a moth in this country called the Essex Emerald, which sadly is now extinct. And it did exactly the same thing with its food plant, which was sea wormwood. But interestingly, I noticed um, in another couple of members of this group of moths, the emeralds. Oh, sorry, there's a there's a blotched emerald, beautiful moth. That's the adult. So I noticed in a couple of other species during their diapause, that's the overwintering stage, where here it is, the large emerald caterpillar resting on a birch twig. And it has become covered in little bits of algae. So you can see this green here. It's, it's not green coloration on the caterpillar. It's actually algae sticking to the surface. And actually, I have to say that it's one advantage of these online talks, because if you were in the back of a hall, you'd struggle to see the detail. And in fact, of course, the, the book was a field guide. And so the uh, size of the photos in there was limited by the fact it was a field guide. So you're going to be able to see it much more clearly on the screen now. So this is a large emerald caterpillar, which has gained algae to aid its crypsis through the winter. And then in the spring, it sheds its skin, takes on this appearance and carries on feeding on the birch leaves. And also I noticed again in the same small group of moths, the emeralds, this, the common emerald, and that does the same thing in its overwintering stage. So here it is, there's lots of little bits of green on it here, around, around the head and the legs as well. And if you notice on the back here, you can see what a rough surface, it, surface the, uh, the, the skin has. So there's thousands and thousands of little projections, microscopic projections really, on the skin of this caterpillar, which just makes it sticky. How the algae actually get there, I'm not sure, but they do, and it certainly aids the crypsis. So it's interesting that these two emeralds with their overwintering in, in star gaining algae, and the other two, um, the blotched emerald and the now extinct Essex emerald, actually sticking bits of plant material onto their bodies. And there's the common emerald caterpillar when it sheds its skin in the spring carry on feeding. Now what about this? This is the brimstone moth caterpillar, which is a pretty good mimic of a, or twig, or uh, I suppose just crypsis in reality. I'm just blending in with the, uh, the background of the, of the twig here. So, and it's got these projections on it, which either look like buds or thorns or whatever. But um, you'll notice that it's got this grayish brown body coloration here. And then patches of green, which look rather like algae growing on a twig. But in this case, there aren't any algae. The skin of this um, caterpillar is perfectly smooth. And um, the green is just green coloration on the skin, just giving the appearance of an alga colored twig. So it's the, it's the same sort of deception, but achieved in a different way. And the caterpillars are the stage in which most butterflies and moths spend the winter. And so they may have to cope with all sorts of different seasons. So this is the scarce silver lines caterpillar now, which has to cope with, uh, with a few seasons. So this is in late summer underneath an oak leaf. So it's a green caterpillar under a green leaf feeding away on the undersurface. And then for the winter, it takes on this grayish brown appearance and gains this saddle here um, on the thorax, which looks rather like a leaf scar or a bud on the oak. So very difficult to see in the winter. Then in the spring, when the oak buds start bursting and it starts feeding again, here's the expanding oak bud and here's the caterpillar. So it's got this green coloration down the side here. And then low down there's this reddish brown stripe, another one on the dorsum, looking just like the, the um, bud scales of the opening oak buds. You've got the green and the bud scales and the green and the 
and the reddish brown coloration on the caterpillar. So it remains cryptic during the spring. Then when the leaves are all out on the tree and it's, open, it's feeding openly on the, the expanded leaves, it takes on this green appearance again. So it's amazing really that it takes on these four different appearances to cope with the different seasons. And there is the scarce silver lines. Now here's another cryptic moth for you. Can you see the moth? It's right in the middle of the screen. So this is a micro moth, though a sort of fairly large micro moth called Ipsilofa macronella. And here it is resting on a dead patch of uh, wood small reed, Calamagrostis epigegios. So these it's these are just the, you know, in the, it's, this is in the early spring now when the when the new shoots haven't really come up. So it's remaining its cryptus there pretty well. So if I crop the image, and there you are, so here's the moth right in the middle here. Very hard to see amongst the, the dead Calamagrostis leaves. Right. So and then everybody's favourite, the buff tip moth here shown among a batch of broken birch twigs, which clearly it blends in with very, very well. Okay, so I'm just going to crop that image now and we can look at it in more detail. So here on the forewing, you've got this dark greyish coloration of the forewing, just like the dark grey of the birch twig. And here you've got the light grey, just like the light grey lichen growing on the birch twig. Then you've got the buff tip to the wing and the head and the front of the thorax, just like the buff coloration of the broken wood, the end, end of the twig. And notice also at the edge of these buff patches on the moth, you've got this sort of dark, light, dark appearance. And again, on the head end, dark, light, dark. And it's just like the bar, how the bark breaks. It's dark, light, dark. And again here, dark, light, dark. So it's absolutely extraordinary how all this has evolved over the millions of years. Right, and then a number of caterpillars just make themselves inconspicuous on the twigs by looking like twigs, really. So this is a caterpillar of the September thorn moth with all sorts of various um, markings and projections on it. So here on the oak twig, we've got a leaf scar here. And you can see that that leaf scar looks very like this mark here or this mark here. And in addition, we've got these projections here looking rather, and in the front as well, looking rather like buds or other projections on the, on the oak twig. So it'd be very difficult to see. Now in sharp contrast to Crypsis, we have warning coloration or apisomatism. So this is the familiar cinnabar moth caterpillar with its uh, distinctive and obvious yellow and black appearance. Sadly, they're much less common than they were, but here it is feeding on its food plant ragwort. So it is distasteful. So if birds try and eat one of these, they really they realize it's not good to eat and soon learn to leave them alone. And in fact, it's forming part of a malarian mimicry complex with other insects like wasps and hornets and so on, which also have yellow and black stripes. So malarian mimicry is where more than one injurious animal mimics another such that the predators have to take less of each before they learn to leave them alone. So the birds have to learn to leave these alone. But there is one bird that will eat them and in fact really likes to eat them and that's the cuckoo. And in fact, this is the main food of the juvenile cuckoos before they head off for Africa. So then we'll move on to the adult, which again is aposematic, brightly coloured, flies by day, and uh, birds soon learn to leave it alone. And then there's other injurious larvae as well. This is the brown tail moth, which is gregarious until it's almost fully fed when they disperse a bit. 
but this is really a horrid caterpillar. I mean, it's the, it, the hairs are terribly irritant and it's not so much these long hairs that you can see, it's these brown cushions here on the back. So these brown cushions are made up of large numbers of half millimeter long barbed hairs, which cause a terrible irritation. And it's variously quoted that there are half a million to two million of these tiny little hairs on each caterpillar. And they really do cause a shocking rash if you pick these things up. So birds learn to leave them alone. But again, the cuckoo will eat them. And in fact, in terms of the cuckoo eating these um, toxic caterpillars, they actually prefer to, I mean, you know, it is their, it is their main food. It's not that they just happen to take them amongst other things. They seem to positively like them. Right, so we now move on to another caterpillar, the vapor moth. So the brown tail and the vapor moth are both in the subfamily Limantrianae of the family Arebidae. And again, this vapor moth caterpillar has very irritant hairs. So the birds wouldn't want to take them. But I want you to note these forward pointing tufts here, the dorsal tufts here, and a tuft on the tail end here. So if we move on to the next caterpillar now, this is in a completely different family now. So this is, an, this is in the Noctuidae. And this is an example, I'm sure, of Batesian mimicry, because you'll notice the tufts here on the front, just like the vapor, tufts on the dorsum here, another tuft on the tail end. So Batesian mimicry is when a caterpillar or an animal that tastes good mimics one that is injurious to gain benefit from the uh, fact that the birds will have learned to leave the other one alone. If we put them side by side, you can see how similar they are and how remarkable the mimicry is really. The coloration of these things is to an extent variable, but in this particular case, I mean, even the coloration is the same, isn't it? But the most striking thing is these tufts in the same place. So that's Batesian mimicry. And this is in the family Lassiocampidae now. This is a drinker moth caterpillar. And the Lassiocampidae is the other group of moths which has irritant hairs. So again, if you pick these things up, you get a shocking rash. And uh, yet, and so birds leave them alone, except the cuckoo. And in fact, you know, the drinker moth caterpillar is a big caterpillar. And it seems to be the principal food of the cuckoo when they arrive in spring and early summer. Now, this is a young lobster moth caterpillar. Lobster moth, very interesting. The first in the star eats nothing but its eggshell. So it hatches out of the egg. It won't eat leaf material at all. It eats the eggshell, and in fact, it has to eat the eggshell. And then it sheds its skin, and this is the second instar now, although the first instar looks just the same as this, really. And this is most likely an ant mimic. So we've got these abnormally long true legs here, and we've got these tails at the rear end, and I, I reckon that's actually mimicking an ant at both ends of the body. And in fact, there's a much bigger caterpillar in Malaysia which lives amongst ant infested branches and clearly mimicking an ant at both ends of the body. So this is the young lobster moth caterpillar, but when it's fully fed, that's what the lobster moth caterpillar looks like at rest. It's a really bizarre looking creature. But if it's disturbed, it splays out these long true legs in a rather threatening manner. And again, you'll be able to see a bit of detail here that you wouldn't be able to see in the back of a room which is this little gland here on the first thoracic segment, which is said to be able to squirt out acetic acid and formic acid. I've never managed to get one to do so, but presumably it does, and there's clearly a gland there. The puss moth caterpillar has a gland in a similar place, and that certainly can squirt out very pungent formic acid. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Anyway, we'll come back to the lobster moth caterpillar with another of its defense mechanisms later on.
Now, don't worry, the screen's supposed to be black now. I showed you that last slide very briefly, and I want you to just reflect whether you saw a moth or not on it. And the point I'm making is that birds aren't sitting around staring at a screen like you are. They're hopping around maybe in the hedges um, at, at high speed, getting partial views possibly, you know, with leaves in the way or in dappled light. So, you know, their chances of spotting something aren't as great as yours. So we'll look at the slide again. And um, if you hadn't seen the moth, which I'm sure some of you won't have done, it's here, okay? This is a moth called the Chinese character, which is a pretty good bird dropping mimic, really. So bird dropping mimicry is very common among moths and caterpillars of the right size. And indeed, other invertebrate orders as well, other insect orders and spiders, all sorts. And it's particularly common in moths that just happen to be about the right size. So in the family of micromoths, the Tortricidae, which is a sort of larger end of the micromoths, they just happen to be about the right size. And there's lots and lots of bird dropping mimics among them. So I'm just gonna crop this image now so you get a better view. Here we are, so here's the Chinese character looking down on it. And it looks jolly like a bird dropping, really. If we look at the moth from the side view, that's what it looks like. Well, one thing that's important about bird dropping, as I alluded to just now, is that you can only get away with mimicking a bird dropping if you're about the same size as a bird dropping. So if we look at this caterpillar, this is caterpillar of the older moth, and this will either be its third or fourth instar, I can't remember. But um, it doesn't really matter, they look the same. And it's, it's really a remarkable mimic of a bird dropping. But the thing is, the older moth can get away with it at this stage. But when it's in its final instar, it's just too big to pretend to be a bird dropping anymore. So just bear this image in mind. So it looks like that one moment, and then it sheds its skin to enter its final instar, and looks like that. So it's exactly the same caterpillar, it's just shed its skin. And now it takes on this typical yellow and black warning coloration. Uh, so it's undoubtedly a Batesian mimic of the complex of cinnabar moth caterpillars, wasps and hornets and so on. So remarkable really. And here's another Batesian mimic, the hornet moth. So the hornet moth really is a remarkable mimic. It's about the same size as a hornet. It's got clear wings like a hornet. And it flies with a very rapid wing beat like a hornet, and even buzzes as it flies. So this is the female on top here that's uh, just emerged. And she's got these little gray scales here, which are deciduous and they'll fall off as soon as she flies. And the first thing that happens as soon as she's dried her wings is the male comes in and mates and here's the male who clearly has flown, and you can see that the deciduous scale, scales have fallen off his wings. And this is another moth in the same family, the Cessiodi, but this is a smaller one now. This is the yellow-legged clear wing. And, um, you know, that's a pretty good mimic of a wasp. Maybe no particular species of wasp, but it's just that yellow and black striped coloration. Then here we've got the narrow bordered bee hawk moth, which is a bumblebee mimic. So this one's just emerged and you can see the light gray scales here, uh, deciduous and they will fall off as soon as it flies. So very good bumblebee mimic. I think it looks most like the common car to be, and maybe it's specifically mimicking that, who knows. But uh, there's a mating pair and you can see how the Deciduous scales have fallen off, the wings are clear, even more like a bumblebee. Now, snake mimicry. So this isn't a British caterpillar, but I can't talk about snake mimicry without showing this slide really. So over many years, I've been developing some ideas about snake mimicry among our caterpillars. And when it came to the book, I wanted to write about it. And so 
I really needed to get hold of this picture, really. So I contacted Professor Daniel Jansen, who's a world famous ecologist from the University of Pennsylvania, who spent a long time studying the ecology of the rainforest of Costa Rica. And uh, so Dan Jansen very kindly uh, sent me this photo and allowed me to use it for this, these purposes. And he also sent me a paper that he'd written and that's about snake mimicry within the sort of Costa Rica rainforest where he's been working. And it was very interesting really, because it, it reinforced some of the ideas or all the ideas that I'd developed, but also he made a, a few extra very good points which just hadn't occurred to me, um, even though they're relatively simple. So if you want to, read the paper and I do recommend it if you put Daniel Jansen J-A-N-Z-E-N snake mimicry paper into Google you'll come up with it and there's all sorts of images of snake mimicking caterpillars there and some pupae as well that are mimicking snakes and also if you want to see even more you can just put snake mimicking caterpillars into Google and you'd be amazed what you what you come up with I mean most examples are in the tropics but uh, I don't think that need put us off actually. So snake mimicry, I think one of the first things to say is that the evidence that caterpillars mimic snakes is circumstantial. So you could potentially design an experiment to show that birds avoid caterpillars that look like this, but you cannot design one to show that it's because they look like snakes. And to be honest, it's the same for bird dropping mimicry as well. You could design an experiment to show that birds don't spot the, the moths looking like um, bird dropping, but you can't design an experiment to show that it's because they look like bird droppings. So I think few people, if anybody, would deny that that's a snake mimic. And in fact, when it's um, at rest, it's stretched out along its twig, looking fairly cryptic and not like a snake at all. It's when it's disturbed, it lets go with its front pairs of prolegs, twists its body over. So this is the ventral surface that you're seeing at the front end here. And then it puffs up this end, showing off these eye spots here. So notice the sort of swollen part uh, tapering down to the front and these eye spots. Now, as we said with the cinnabar moth caterpillar and wasps and hornets and so on the birds can try one or two or however many it takes and get stung or realize it's a bad tasting toxic meal and then learn to leave these things alone but the same learning opportunities aren't there when it comes to bird when it comes to snake mimicry rather because the first bird snake interaction is likely to prove fatal to the bird so the idea is that the fear of snakes is innate. It's hardwired into the brain of the bird. So in other words, there's a crude image of a snake in the bird's brain, and it just enables it to respond to various visual cues and make the decision to flee. And of course, as we've said, the birds are hopping around at high speed, getting partially obscured views in dappled light. And so they've got to make a decision very, very quickly. Is this food or is it a snake? Do I, do I flee? And so the only safe thing is, is to flee really. So it's an innate fear of snakes. And then the other thing that's different from bird dropping mimicry is we said with bird dropping mimicry, you have to be about the same size as a bird dropping to get away with it. But with snake mimicry, that doesn't seem to be the case. And in fact, even although this is a big caterpillar, a hawk moth, in fact, Hemeroplanes triptolemus, it's still smaller than a snake. OK, so we'll move on to UK examples now. So this is the elephant hawk moth. and This has been long regarded as a snake mimic, really. And you'll see the same sort of features. It's just not as impressive, that's all. So you've got the swollen area at the front of the abdomen here, these eye-like markings here, tapering down to the head end. In fact, the thorax and the head can be retracted within the first abdominal segment if the caterpillar is disturbed. 
So it's a pretty good snake mimic, really. And when you see them moving, they sort of move a little bit and then stop and then go off again. It's, it's rather a snake-like movement, to be honest. This is a friend's dog that happened to notice one of these things as they were walking along. And the dog was really perturbed, actually. It started growling, scratching at the ground and clearing vegetation around this caterpillar and it wouldn't touch it. It was clearly bothered by it. OK, and um, this is the small elephant hawk moth now. Similar sort of effect with the swollen anterior sec section, the, the full size spots tapering down to the head. And this one's got a particularly reticulated pattern, really. Right, so we're now going to extrapolate all this further, because traditionally that's about as far as it's got in this country, but I think we can take it an awful lot further. So this is caterpillar of a moth now called the rosy marbled, which is a lot smaller. This is quite a small caterpillar, but it's got the same sort of features actually. It's got a swollen area here centered on the first abdominal segment with these um, bright spots here. I mean, they're not as convincing as eye spots as the elephant hawk moth, but the thing is, it seems that as smaller the caterpillar gets, the less surf surface area there is. Uh, to produce such an intricate pattern, but it's probably good enough and as good as it can be. So we've got this swollen section centered on A1, tapering down to the head, and these bright spots here. If we look at it from the side, you can see it's swollen in this plane as well on this first abdominal seg segment. Okay, and then this is the um, dark spectacle caterpillar now. So this one's particularly swollen. Um, here on the second abdominal segment, it's got the bright spots on the first abdominal segment and it's tapering down to the head. So again, it's the same, so you can really extrapolate from Hemeroplanis tryptolemus to elephant hawk moth to this dark spectacle. It's all the same sort of features, it's just the smaller the caterpillar, the less intricate it can be. This is significantly bigger than the last one, by the way. But then, oh, there's a snake there, okay. I could have shown you any any snake, actually, it doesn't really matter, but you've got this particular shape of the, the head of a snake here, and this one happens to have yellow spots here, but it doesn't really matter. And now, before you think I've gone completely mad, let me tell you that I don't think that looks like a snake either. But um, this is another quite small caterpillar now. This is the satin wave stretched out here. But I want you to notice that on the fifth abdominal segment here, there's um, a bit of a flange here, so it's wider than the other segments. And the thing is that this isn't the normal resting posture of the satin wave. It's normal resting posture, it's the front end of the caterpillar curled up underneath the rear end, like that. And that shows off these, these bright spots, which are whitish or yellow, on the fifth abdominal segment, extending into the flange, and it's tapering down to the rear end of the body. So whatever's going on here, it's clearly doing the same as the dark spectacle, but at the other end of the body. Right, so this is the satin wave, quite a small moth. And then what about that? So there's no eye spots on this one, but it's a pretty good, um, snake-like shape, snake head shape at the front of the body, isn't it? So I reckon that that also is a snake mimic. So this is the blood vein caterpillar, very unusual shape. And then this is the ribboned wave now. So the ribboned wave's got this dark uh, grayish brown coloration for most of the body. But then from the fifth abdominal segment back, it's pale. And also the fifth abdominal segment's got these flanges here. Um, and it must be pale for a reason. And we've said before, that, or maybe I haven't said, I'm not sure now, but I did say that the caterpillar has to eat and not be eaten. And so whatever its appearance is, it's almost certain to be something to do with defense. So whatever the caterpillar looks like, it demands an explanation which centers around defense. So it's got this pale area at the rear end, and within it, it's showing off this dark 
forked tongue-like appearance here. And the forks of the tongue extend into the lateral flanges here. So I would argue that that's a mimicking a snake by its forked tongue. And one interesting thing is that these last three examples, the uh, satin wave with its um, yellow spots towards the rear end, tapering to the rear end, the blood vein with the expanded anterior part of the body, and this ribboned wave with the forked tongue appearance on the rear end are all mimicking snakes in different ways, and yet they all belong to a small group of moths, the subfamily Sterinae of the Geometridae. So it may be something about the habits of this group of caterpillars that has um, made them particularly liable to evolve snake mimicry. Now, this is the swallowtail butterfly caterpillar, which, as you know, is confined to the wetlands of East Anglia in this country. But uh, on in continental Europe, it's a pretty common butterfly, actually. So um, this is one probably warningly coloured that I took in Greece. So that's it at rest on its food plant. But if it's disturbed, then it shoots out this structure here from the first thoracic segment which uh, is called the osmaterium, and it's said to give off an acrid smell. But I reckon that would be a pretty good fork tongue impression as well. So it may be that it's also frightening of uh, predators as a result of snake mimicry through this fork tongue appearance. So can we think of anything that has an expanded section of the body mimicking a snake and a fork tongue? Well, yes, we can. And we're back to the lobster moth now. This is the lobster moth caterpillar viewed from the rear. It's got an expanded bit here on the seventh abdominal segment, and a much more expanded bit on the eighth abdominal segment. And its anal claspers are modified into these tails here, which give the impression of a forked tongue. So I'll show you another image of another example here. And I think really, that's a bit better, showing it a bit better than the previous photo. You've got this expanded bit here, the forked tongue, and it, it looks very cobra-like, I reckon. And you're going to say to me, don't be silly, there's no cobras here. But that doesn't matter, because don't forget that many of our insectivorous birds, which are arriving now, spend much of their lives in the tropics, and there are cobras in tropical Africa. Snakes are much more common in tropical Africa. And there's even arboreal specialist bird-eating snakes. So I think that's a really important point that many of our insectivorous birds are spending a lot of their time in tropical Africa. Okay, so I said that um, Professor Jansen had found a number of pupae which were mimicking snakes in Costa Rica. Have we got any? Yes, I believe we have, but there is only one, and that's this. So this is the pupa of the lilac beauty, and it's a most unusual shape for a pupa. And it's made here on its on honeysuckle leaf, the food plant's honeysuckle, and it's just suspended there by the flimsiest of cocoons, really, just a few strands of silk holding it in place. So it's clearly exposing the, the whole body of the pupa um, for any, any predators to see. But it's unusually expanded in the middle here, this, uh, this pupa, and it tapers down to both ends, actually. This is the rear end, obviously. And, but at the front end, there's these two eye-like marks. And if you have a look at Professor Jansen's paper, you'll see pupae which he's um, got there as snake mimics, looking very like this. But I think that's the only one we have in this country, the lilac beauty. And how far can we take it? Well, this is quite a small caterpillar too. This is the small fan foot. And I think if you were just shown that in isolation, you wouldn't think, you know, any chance that's a snake mimic. But, you know, I just wonder, because we have to explain the appearance of caterpillars in terms of their defense 
And there are these yellow, prominent yellow spots here. And it's nothing like as impressive as the other things I've shown you, but it just may be that that's enough to just trigger, trigger those um, flight responses in the, in the birds. They've got to decide very quickly whether this could be a snake or not. So I just leave you with that thought. And there's all sorts of other examples with similar spots in that sort of position, which may be acting in the same way. So I just want to now recap on snake mimicry, the, the main points and to make one or two extra ones. So the evidence is circumstantial. The bird's fear of snakes is innate and not learnt. Birds are hopping around quickly, getting brief, partially obscured views of the larvae. They cannot afford to make a mistake. Size does not seem to be important with regard to snake mimicry. The smaller the larva, the less precise the mimicry, but it's probably as good as it can be. Snake mimicry clearly readily evolves, and you've seen examples that I've just shown you from six different families of the Lepidoptera in this country. Most examples are cryptic at a distance, but seen as snake-like at close quarters. Insectivorous birds, many of them migrate to the tropics where snakes are commoner. Now the maintenance of the mimicry does not depend upon the model outnumbering the mimic. So for Batesian mimicry, really the model is outnumbers the mimic because if it was the other way around, the deceit would be uncovered. But in this case, that doesn't seem to be the case. And finally, it's a low cost defense. So in other words, it doesn't depend on the synthesis of expensive toxins or the growing of expensive hairs. It's just the pattern on the caterpillar. Right now for the twist in the tail. So this isn't what I really want to talk to you about, but I've thrown in this slide here of Psyche Castor larval case because when you walk around the countryside, you will have seen these. You may not have realized what they are, but that's what they are. Psyche castor. This is the larval case which it carries around. Here, the female moth has emerged from the case. She's wingless. The male flies in and they mate. Then she lays her eggs in the case. But what I want to talk to you about is this moth in the same family, Acanthus psyche atra. And these are Phil Sterling's photos because it's not a common species and he's managed to find it and study it, but I've never seen it. So this is the male Acanthus psyche atra having emerged from the case here. And that's the case of a female here. And here's the female moth partially extruding from the case. So when the caterpillar pupates, it pupates either with the head up this end or head down this end, but pupates head up, the male flies in and mates with this end of the moth, and then the female is just entombed in that case. She never comes out of it. But if she's pupated the other way around, the male's got this very extensile abdomen, which manages to get in the case, work its way up and around to mate with th at this end with the female. And the female can just undergo some peristaltic movements, and here she is, partially out of the case. And she drops to the ground, and that's the female moth. And it's a heathland species, so she's likely to drop on this dark peaty soil and look, frankly, pretty conspicuous. So it has no wings, no legs, no antennae, no scales, and can do the feeblest of peristaltic movements, and that's it, really. It's almost as if it wants to be eaten. Well, in fact, in the 1950s, somebody fed a number of these female Acanthus psyche atra to a captive robin. And lo and behold, in due course, a few caterpillars of Acanthus psyche atra appeared from the robin's droppings. Now, I don't think very many appeared. And I'd, so the survival didn't seem to be very great in the bird's gut. But it's just possible that reptiles like lizards on a Heathland, or what eat these things, and it may be that um, survival is a bit better through the gut of a lizard. We just don't know. We don't know enough about this. But of course, dispersal for this species is really difficult. 
because the only way in which it can move any distance is as a caterpillar, but it's carrying a, you know, quite a burdensome case around, so it's not going to go very far at all. So maybe this moth really wants to be eaten. So thank you for listening. That's the end, folks. <laughs>